All right, good morning or afternoon, I guess. Um, welcome, welcome to our conversation today uh, on systemic racism and equity in child welfare. We're gonna be looking at the role of social work education in perpetuating and challenging inequities. We are really happy to have you here with us today um, and back for another important conversation. My name is Naomi Reddish and I coordinate the Title IV-E Child Welfare Stipend Program here at Virginia Commonwealth University. And good morning, everyone. My name is Abigail Say, and I am a second year MSW student, as well as a child welfare stipend student, and I'll be moderating the conversation today. Thank you, Abigail. So why are we here today? Many of you attended the webinar that we hosted in November that focused on the history of child welfare, inequities, and change efforts. We received a great response from the community and heard from you a desire to continue that conversation. So today, uh, we're gonna focus on social work education and its role in child welfare workforce development. For this conversation, we are going to use child welfare and child serving agency or child serving interchangeably at times uh, because all child, child serving systems are a part of the larger child welfare system. For example, your work in schools, mental health, residential settings, juvenile justice, um, private foster care and adoption agencies, healthcare, the Department of Social Services, all serve children and their families and therefore have a work a role in this work of systemic change. So as a social work community, we are having discussions about the impact of systemic racism and inequities in our intersecting systems, including child welfare. It's important for us to learn and to teach students about the impact that our social work history has had on oppressed populations and to prepare our workforce to challenge inequities in our social work practice. And as we work to affect change in the child serving community, it is important for anti-racist discourse to be included in all facets of social work education. So how can social work education better prepare students in the workforce? We're going to delve more into this conversation today and we're glad you are here for our panel discussion with community members. But before we begin, let's go over the structure of the webinar today. One of our panelists will start by providing the history of social work, then we'll move into the panel discussion session to delve more into the impact of social work education in perpetuating and challenging inequities in our social work practice. At the end, we will have a Q&A session. So please, please ask, add your questions as they come up using the Q&A feature, and we will do our best to address as many as we can as time permits. Also, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording and additional resources with you via email, as well as a feedback form. We welcome interactions in the chat, so please feel free to share your thoughts. Make sure that you select panelists and attendees so that everyone will be able to see your questions or resources shared. All right. Our professional code of ethics and core values call us to a commitment to social justice and to valuing the dignity and worth of every person. It's time for us to look at our history and make some changes. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Abigail for introductions of our panelists. Thank you, Naomi. Now we would like to introduce the wonderful panelists who are with us today. First, we have Danica Briggs, who is the Assistant Director of Chesterfield Colonial Heights Department of Social Services, a field instructor, a VCU Child Welfare Stipend Program alumni and serves on the CSWSB Advisory Committee. Next, we have Daryl Fraser, who is an Associate Professor in Teaching here at VCU School of Social Work, a faculty field liaison, the former president of the Richmond Association of Black Social Workers, and also has practice and experience in child servant settings. And lastly, um, we have Allison Gilbreth, who is the Policy and Program Director of Voices for Virginia's Children. She is also a VCU alumni, adjunct faculty instructor, and also a field liaison. 
So I just wanna thank you all for being with us today and we look forward to having this great conversation. But before we get to the panel discussion, I will leave it to Daryl to begin by providing some historical content and development of social work in general, as well as specific VCU context and history. Thank you, Abigail. And I wanna thank you, um, Naomi um, and uh, Jamie as well for coordinating this um, event today. Um, we're talking about systemic racism and equity in child welfare um, and the role of social work education. And I think before we can actually even get into having that conversation, um, I think it's important for us to do a, a quick throwback and look at our history uh, as an organization, the, the social work profession. Um, and, I, and, and the reason being is because I believe we have a, a lot of times when we go back and look at history, history is told from, the, from a certain slanted perspective. And I think sometimes we look at history through rose colored glasses, right? So, um, and I also believe personally that, you know, as a social work practitioner, history, we have to be history, we have to be historians as well in our studies. So when you go back and look at um, our profession, it was founded by Jane Addams in the early 1900s, right? And um, Jane Addams was a white woman um, and sort of her goal, one of the first things that she ventured out in doing was um, creating and opening settlement houses, right? Um, settlement houses in, in the city of Chicago with the intention and purpose of, you know, creating opportunities for um, immigrants, you know, um, immigrants of different cultural backgrounds. And the settlement houses, the purposes of that was to, you know, kind of um, have people of privilege. Um, it was typically women of privilege to create spaces for um, children, um, women to, to empower them um, to have them learn about culture, to have them learn about American society. So it started off with great intentions, right? Um, also in her work, what she was doing was highlighting the role and importance of women and women's role in society and shaping and creating society, right? So it was a lot of great intentions. However, when we look back at our history, right? This is the early 1900s, we can't talk about the, her history without talking about the conditions and society and what that meant for all people, particularly black peoples in this country. So um, if we go back, you know, um, slavery ended in 1865. Um, and in this country, there was this question about what do we do with this new population of uh, black people? Um, what are we gonna do with them? How do we, how do we integrate them into society? So, you know, there was reconstruction, there was efforts um, on that end. Um, however, also at that time, what we had happening was Jim Crow laws, which basically uh, uh, legalized and, 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 and mandated segregation. So when you, when you fast forward to the early 1900s and you consider um, Jane Addams and the work that she's doing, a lot of the work did not include, you know, these African-Americans. Right, um, those settlement houses weren't designed for African Americans. So, um, from its outset, you know, the social work profession wasn't really designed to address the, the, the issues and the plight of African Americans. Um, we could fast forward um, beyond that, and 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 I would even add to that: um, we had in in the Black community, we had scholars, we had people that were trying to deal with the plight of. Um, black Americans. You had your W.E.B. Du Bois's, you had your Ida B. Wells, um, you had your Phyllis Wheatley, right? Um, Phyllis Wheatley's. Um, you had a lot of people trying to um, figure out what we could do to address um, the plight of uh, black people in this country. Um, so, but fast forward, you know, we have our social work profession and um, the 1960s, um, we had the rise of the black social work movement. Right, so actually when you look back and think about what was going on in the country at the time, during the 50s and 60s, we had the civil rights era, right? And then we had the, the, the black power movement in the, in the 60s. You had the, the, the organizations like uh, the Black Panthers who were, um, who created um, free lunch programs, right? 
Um, oftentimes we talk about um, the history of social welfare in this country, social work. We don't include people who are not professional social workers, right? Um, but you know, black people have definitely contributed to social work movements in this country. Um, but uh, thinking back to the '60s um, and all of what was going on, you know, you had you had black social workers um, um, contributing to the profession, and black social workers were a part of you know you know the the the, the what you would call the uh, um, NASW at the time and other um, prominent social work groups. And um, there were black social workers in various cities going to different conferences and feeling like, you know, those uh, mainstream organizations were not actually addressing the unique needs of uh, black families and black communities. So um, 1968, if we go back to that year, um, that was the year that Dr. King got um, killed, right? Um, and it's not just the black social workers. When you go back and look at history, in, in most mainstream organizations, right? You have the Association of Psychologists. Um, you have um, associations for lawyers. Um, there were different um, caucuses within these mainstream organizations that, um, you know, there were, there were caucuses that were developed to address black issues, but um, those caucuses ended up breaking apart from those mainstream organizations because um, they felt like they needed a, a space for, for Black voices. So in 1968, May exactly of 1968 is when the, the, the National Association of Black Social Workers was formed. And I, I like to call the NABSW the original Black Lives Matter because they were at a particular conference in, um, in, in, in uh, San Francisco in 1968. And um, a lot of the students and younger black professionals or black professionals started to protest. They did walkouts because they felt like those organizations were not addressing the unique needs in the black community. And um, finally, they decided to walk out and they went to a church across the street from this particular conference and they decided to start the National Association of Black Social Workers. Um, sometimes I, I know that that history is pretty much missing from a lot of social work education. And, and I didn't learn about it until I actually became a member, right? But um, the black social workers, um, some of the early issues they dealt with was um, transracial adoption. Um, and they've been you know, um, castigated for it because people are like, well, you have kids and they should be adopted. If they have a home they need to go to, um, then they should go to that. However, that's not what the, the issue that, that they were raising. They were saying that at the time, what was going on was black families were being separated, right? Without um, any kind of um, uh, uh, credence or any kind of attention to trying to find, um, you know, uh, suitable uh, people within that community. Um, one thing you, 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 if you, if you don't know about people in the black community is that we've always um, taken care of our own. Um, we, we have this thing where we will say, we may call each other's brothers and sisters and cousins, it may not be blood related, right? Um, you have cousins down the streets or neighbors down the street that will raise another person's child and some of those things were not considered. So. Um, those were the, some of the issues that um, black social workers were trying to bring to the table and saying in our unique needs, we're being looked at as a, 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 a group with deficits and not looking at the strengths within our community, right? How we've been able to succeed. Um, we, again, going back to the history of our country, um, the institution of slavery really did a, did a number on the black family in separating black families. And, um, Repeatedly in the, in, in the course of history, what we see time and again is how um, the system continually separates black families. So um, that, that's, that's a part of it, right? So understanding that um, self-determination and understanding that um, there are unique needs um, and it's not, I would, I, would, I would say, particularly in the black community, because we're talking about anti-black racism, but you know, um, we're talking about culture and we're talking about um, uh, 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 culture and unique needs, 
um, it's important to kind of understand that um, you can't apply a one size fits all solution to, um, to everyone. Um, I'd like, also like to, to say, even when we consider um, the School of Social Work, right? So the School of Social Work was founded in 1918, right? It was Richmond Professional Institute. Again, we have to go back and look at the history. Love the School of Social Work. I got my, I love VCU. I got my psychology degree from VCU. I got my master's degree from VCU. I've worked at the hospital and I'm teaching there, right? Um, when we go back and look at the history of um, VCU, um, that first class, you know, they were not accepting um, black people. Um, Grace Harris, she's very much celebrated at VCU, um, the, at the, the entire university. There's a whole building named after her, right? Um, she was the dean of the VCU School of Social Work. But many people may or may not know, I think most people may not know that she um, actually applied to graduate school in 1954 and was denied entry, right? Because of the law. The law stated that black people couldn't go to um, state state funded schools. And um, our state would actually go out their way and fund people to go out of state, black people to go out of state to go to school. Um, but that's just an example of what, 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 I'm, what I'm talking about in terms of history is that we have to not just, you know, listen to history with, um, and just, just take that in, but we have to be critical thinkers, right? And we have to not just um, look at things through a rose colored glass. Um, history is important. I would even say even any current day issue, if we go back and look at the historical context of it, when we look at it through uh, a, a, a racialized lens, you start to kind of understand and unpack that problems are not um, isolated and um, they, they, they're, not, um, uh, uh, they're not the fault of the victim. I think that's what happens when we don't understand history and put things into context, is that we start to look at individuals and we blame victims for the, the conditions that they're in. So um, I hope that was helpful, um, but uh, that was sort of kind of what I wanted to kind of get across in terms of understanding the historical context of current day issues. Thank you so much, Daryl, for providing us the historical context of social work and also talking about the importance of being critical of history that we consume and being mindful of the times that it was written and from whose perspective it was from. So now let's talk about racist ideologies and practices that manifest in our communities that lead people to social work. What are your thoughts about this connection? I'm happy to start that answer and then my uh, great other uh, panelists can join in after. And thanks so much for that history and background there. I think that really helped kick off, off the conversation again. My name is Allison. I'm the Policy and Program Director at Voices for Virginia's Children. And as I answer that question, I think it's important in the context of this conversation to know um, that while I identify as a Black woman, I also identify as a child who had experience in child welfare system, as a person who has um, had a kinship child in, in my placement, um, and has a, a professional degree in, with an MSW and child welfare interaction in that side. So. Um, this answer comes from many different perspectives. But I think one of the things that uh, the child welfare sector, and when I say child welfare, I'm not just talking about uh, local departments of social services or Virginia Department of Social Services. I'm talking about every single entity that impacts children and families. So that could be a, a clinician, that could be um, a person who works at a private child placing agency. But to the extent that uh, sometimes it cultivates a person who wants to be a savior. We see children or we believe that children need our saving, that families need our saving. And part of white saviorism is defined in that space. It is the thought that my life is um, better than this person or this culture's life and therefore I need to put my beliefs and ideologies on this culture and um, to remove these children who are at risk, at harm, whatever it is from their worldview. Uh, and so 
we have a whole profession set up where we say, yes, the, that is exactly what you can do as a, a, a social worker. You can take those beliefs and then be, be, have a career um, and have a career where that's going to be a primary part of your job. Uh, and we're still at a point where we're grappling with that. When you look at the nonprofit sector, for example, you'll see that fewer than 10% of leadership in nonprofit sector are people of color. When you look at our um, state agencies and our local departments, you will see that the majority of people working in those um, industries are white. And so it makes it difficult for when a person of color comes into those types of institutions, for example, someone like myself who sees the world differently. I don't see black families as needing to be saved as a premise of a philosophy of the way I am as a social worker. Uh, and so it, I see how our field really can draw on that, um, that need to feel, to feel fulfilled in white saviorism. Uh, so I'll pass it to my colleagues. Now, Allison, you, you definitely made a really good point there. I know oftentimes when we have families involved in the child welfare system, you know, we're going through that process, we're assessing those families, and we're also looking at how those children are within the context of, say, their foster homes. And many times we may get in situations where um, the belief may be that the children are better off and would have a better life in that foster home than their own with their own family. And it really goes back to what what values or judgments are we making about families in terms of who's best for this child um, and who can provide them a better life. Those values and those judgments are based off of societal expectations. And so when you get to a point where you're talking about, the good enough parent, you know, people will look at you funny and say, well, why wouldn't you want this child to have a better life or experience, you know, the things that a lot of other children's experience, children experience, but we're making those assumptions based off of societal expectations versus really taking into account the role of families, of relationships, the role that our cultural backgrounds play and the importance of respecting those things. I want to come at that question from a from a from a from a different. It's not different, but from a. Um, I, I'll say this. I think um, Neely Fuller, right? M many people don't know who that is, but he's one of the first people that talks about racism being a system. And one quote that stands out to me from Neely Fuller is, "If you don't understand racism, which is white supremacy." Right, his definition of racism is white supremacy. So racism is white supremacy, and white supremacy is racism. Right, um, and what he what he said was, is if you don't understand racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else will confuse you. Everything else will confuse you. So, racism, this ideology of white supremacy, right, um, is something that is inculcated in every last one of us, right? It's inculcated in me as a black man living in this country. It's inculcated in um, white people and everybody else that has gone to school, learned and grew up here, right? And when he talks about racism being a system, right? It talks about it's in our education system. So the things that we learn from our history, how things are taught to us, right? Is, is seeped in, 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 in white supremacist ideology. Right, um, it's in um, it's in everything. It's in the media, right? So what we take in, there's a lot of things that we see on a day to day basis from the time that we're children, right? From commercials and television programs that we get programmed into thinking, right? So for example, coming up, watching the news, you see if you see every night on the news at ten o'clock, black men being you know um, in handcuffs and you know hood over their head being um, walked in you know, being accused of crimes, you start to think that, you know, black people are criminals, right? So I believe in taking things back to its root and really understanding, right? So me as a black man understanding, so this, there's the white saviorism that is even in me, right? So um, first understanding first that, 
one and it be in an agreement that white supremacy ideology is a thing, right? And then start to deconstruct how it impacts me as a person in my behavior, right? So a lot of times I have to go back and, and, and think about, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing and is what I'm doing, um, what, what is it based on? So white supremacy can stop me from saying something or it can make me go along with things, right? So um, going back to the question, I'm sorry, I kind of got off track. Um, how racist ideologies and practices manifest themselves in our community is first, you know, it, we have to agree that it's in the education system, right? It's, it's how, it's a, it's a part of, it's in the water, right? It's not a side from anything else. It's not, you know, because people have a lot of good intentions. I think a lot of people join the profession of social work with good intentions, right? However, if you have the, rape, the, the white supremacy ideology, which is better than less than, this group is better than this, this group, which is less than. Having money gives us more privileges and power or um, having like money is not the, the standard for happiness, right? It's not the standard for culture. However, in our society, we equate money, right, with goodness, right? So um, it's just really kind of trying to, to really deconstruct some of our thinking. Um, so I think there's a lot of people, black, white, whatever, come into the profession with good intentions, right? However, we don't really deconstruct sort of the ideology that's, that's underneath that. So um, I hope that makes sense and answers your question. Yes, and we've talked about the connections or how racist ideologies might manifest in our communities. Um, could we talk a little bit more about how racist ideologies and practices influence our effectiveness in social work practice and specifically in child worker settings as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, in social work, we're, we're taught to look at person and environment. And you, you can't look at person and environment and, and remove race from that equation. And so we, we have to start looking at things through a race equity lens. Um, you know, someone mentioned in the, in the chat, um, what, if, what if there's a course that's on this history? And, and my, my thought would be, how do we infuse this throughout every course? You know, so whether you're in a practice course or you're in a social justice course, you know, we have this race equity lens throughout all of what we're talking about. Um, we see it, you know, in just the way we talk about clients. Um, so you may document that a client is resistant to services or non-compliant with services. But then when you really understand the situation and you find out this is a single grandmother raising four of her grandchildren and working full time, I don't think resistance and non-compliant is really the most accurate description of what you're seeing. But when we write things in that manner, it sends a message about that person that others will read and interpret. And then that further perpetuates, you know, maybe this person isn't the best person to be able to care for these children and we, we need to look at someone else. So I think it's a matter of, again, we, we can't ignore the role that race plays and just being more mindful of that, um, it's awareness. Um, the, the fact that we're hearing so much more about systemic racism, I've heard it more within the last year than, than I've ever heard. And realizing as Daryl stated, we can be mindful of these things and we can change actions and behaviors, but that does not stop the fact that we will still have issues of institutional and systemic racism that will still perpetuate these issues. Tanika, I was just, I was snapping in my, um, you couldn't see me, but in, in, in my chair, when you were saying those things, one of the, the thoughts that I have and a lot, I, I teach social justice in the so, school of social work. I love teaching and I love my students. But one thing is it's acceptable for students who are coming into our schools of social work to not have a base level of knowledge in these issues, to not have any type of historical knowledge that wouldn't be acceptable in many other programs um, where the vast majority of the people, the client populations that you're going to be working with are people of color. And so that's part of the issue as well. It's sort of acceptable to come into my social justice class and not know what a disparity is, to not know what disproportionality is, to for me to teach you 
um, as though these are just such foreign concepts. And really, the, the, when, we, when students come into the program, the base should already be there. And we're having the deep, critical conversations about how do we change these systems? How do we fight systems of oppression instead of here's, the, here's what racism is? Uh, that, that, so I see that as one critical issue as well. And then within uh, the context of child welfare, I think similar there, it's acceptable to come into a, a, a position, um, a starting off position within child welfare, and it's acceptable to have no context of how families of color are treated, have been treated, the cultural history of that organization in the community, why families have good reason to be resistant to receiving services from that agency. All of that is okay to, to, uh, to not know and acceptable to have those types of positions. And it just creates and perpetuates um, issues. And I was on a, a great call this morning with lots of folks within child welfare. And we were talking about you know issues around kinship care, a word that a lot of people don't even understand. But kinship care is what I have always said to people. It's the way Black people have fostered families for generations. We have taken in our kin relatives, and we have done so outside of the formal child welfare system. We have been equipped to know how to navigate uh, challenges within our community, but we also it's, it's the most beautiful thing when children can stay connected to their culture, to their families, when we can reduce their trauma. But what we also have put in place is we haven't given the same benefits or recognition of um, time, commitment, service to Black families in the same way that when a white family becomes an adoptive parent, everyone wraps around that family. We provide them with the financial assistance. We provide them with case management. We celebrate them as a community. Whereas when you're a kinship caregiver, particularly as a Black one, and I have been one, you are sometimes ridiculed. You are questioned of whether you are worthy of this child of which you have already had a relationship with, um, where the child often is begging to come to live with that kinship care provider. But instead, local departments are saying, no, no, we already have someone approved as a local foster home family. It'll be we, we, you know, we're not sure if you're financial standing. I became a kinship care provider at 19 years old. I'm a long time ago now. But um, the, the hurdles that I had to go through to say, even though I'm young, I have my entire family who wants to help this child. It's not just me. My name might be on this piece of paper, but there are 20 people standing behind me who are going to do daycare pickup, who are going to get to the piano lessons, all of these things. Those were not valued and seen from our sector. Uh, and I think if it weren't for part of me, my tenacity in the educational background that I had at the time, um, I, I think my niece would have been in formal foster care. So um, those are my, some of my thoughts. Yeah, Allison, I appreciate you sharing that because that's a, spe a specific example of what I was trying to highlight earlier in, in, in terms of um, how the ideology plays out because, you know, the, the, the nuclear family, right, is not the only family structure, right? But that's the standard that um, people measure other cultures and families by, right? Um, the question was, how do racist ideologies and practices influence our effectiveness? And I think that's it. Um, we don't understand what that means. Sometimes we are operating from a certain um, frame of reference and not really acknowledging, hey, um, you know what, what are the strengths that this family has, right, that's unique and different? And how can we leverage those for the benefit of the child, as opposed to going off of sort of like, you know, how we feel and how we think. Um, we don't question ourselves. And I think that's part of it. I think there's been a lot, there's, there's oftentimes there's a lot of research. And there's research that shows that this program is more effective than others. And blah, 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 blah. And what I think a lot of times what happens too is, is that, you know, because of, you know, our, 
our agency doesn't have the funding or money for this, we're not gonna, we're not gonna push for or influence um, programs and practices and policies that we know to be effective, that we know to be true, right? So a lot of times we default to um, either one, you know, things are just too hard, two, we don't have the money, right? But it all goes back into um, blaming the victim, right? Um, we, we, we put unrealistic expectations. I, I love the example, Danica, that you brought up earlier. Is oftentimes we put unrealistic expectations on, on our families, right? So if we have a grandmother, that was a beautiful example, happens all the time. A grandmother that's raising um, their grandchildren, working full time, we're not trying to figure out, or sometimes the system does not give us the ability to give that person the tools to be successful, right? We look at the deficits and what's not happening. We're looking for quick fixes, right? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things that play into that. And I think also, I, I can't get away from this ideology of, in social work, we talk a lot of times about self-awareness, right? Managing our biases and things like that. Um, however, most people don't know how they're gonna act until the situation comes up, right? Um, I don't, you know, most people don't wake up in the morning saying, you know, I'm gonna go and do something horrible to somebody. But if you have a client that comes into your office that doesn't look like you, that may be a little upset and angry, sometimes we as practitioners might interpret that behavior as them being a certain way, right? Where, or they're just being angry. There's an angry black woman, an angry black man. And it sometimes it can reinforce certain stereotypes and tropes, right? As opposed to looking at this and saying, well, maybe this person is scared and afraid overwhelmed, right? So there's certain stereotypes that even, um, that we're, we're constantly having to battle. And I think so, oftentimes, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna think um, those racist stereotypes constantly are winning. Um, racism also changes and evolves, right? And um, sometimes the, 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 the new racism, right? Um, for example, uh, you know, crack cocaine, right? And, and, and we call it mass incarceration, right? At the time, we don't recognize it. Well, we don't, we don't evaluate it through that lens and say, okay, this is another form of racism, right? We wait till 20 years down the line, once the damage is done, and then we look back at things. We have to be a little bit more um, critical in the math. Daryl, if I can add on to that, and I know Abigail's like, oh, because she needs to move us along, but I just think it's important for us to think about in this pandemic that we are in right now, it is socially acceptable to be a stressed out, sometimes angry parent. It's okay. We're all like, oh, I've been there. I know what it's like. My children are at home with me. I have all of these different requirements on me. I'm trying to do virtual learning. I'm trying to work. It's, it's okay that you yell at your kids or it's okay that you got frustrated or it's okay that you're economically insecure because everybody's feeling it right now. But not last year when before the pandemic happened and when black families were disproportionately economically insecure that wasn't acceptable behavior and families of color were being um treated differently but now it's not the same it we're, we're on a different playing field and we're not even recognizing in the moment that had uh, when I, when I say our and I'm talking about for myself here when our community was experiencing these socioeconomic stressful triggers and environments, the response from our systems was let's take your kids away, let's not support you. But now that it's being impacted by all communities and cultures, even still disproportionately, even more so for families of color. We're saying, oh no, let's let's get this stimulus package passed. Let's get um, you support services. Let's do everything we can because now I identify it in my own race if I were a white person. Um, and so I think in the same way that we, we see differential responses to um, 
substance use disorder that is used by uh, communities of color versus white communities of color, or I'm sorry, white communities, we're seeing the same thing with this pandemic. And if we don't wake up and recognize what is happening right now, we'll just continue to make these same uh, uh, issues that continue for, for, um, further along. Yeah, thank you all so much for such contributions and highlighting um, ways that these racist ideologies do affect our work with clients and our ignorance or unaware of these systems does perpetuate even though we may not know it. And Allison, you touched on this a bit in talking about social work education. Um, so I wanted to talk about racism and social work education. How is social work education upholding and dismantling systemic racism? I'm happy to start and then um, whoever wants to follow can. I think what I, I did mention before, I think part of it is just what is acceptable to get into schools of social work to begin with. Um, you just don't have to have a, a true understanding of race equity issues pretty much at all. It's not really featured on most of the applications. It's not a requirement. It's not like you had to take a certain class before you, you started the program. And I say all this knowing I loved my social work educational background, but I recognize even as an adjunct professor that it lacks that continuous knowledge. Um, it lacks that requirement to truly understand. And I think it also lacks um, how when you, even if you do your absolute best, if you, if you tried everything you could as a student, you graduate and then you go work in these systems that have already been created that you now have to work to dismantle. Um, the program doesn't necessarily teach you how to navigate that. Like I, I, as, a, as an instructor, I want to make sure my students know that when you go into the you know quote unquote real world and you go work, you're going to be working with for people who have been in the sector 20, 30, 40 years who have great knowledge and skills, but sometimes have these other um, have not been educated on really how racism has impacted the system. And if you aren't equipped to work towards dismantling that, then you're just going to fall into it all over again. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. No, I agree, you know, Allison, and also just looking at the coursework um, and ensuring that the, the lectures, the materials that are being shared for students to read, that they are not just focusing on a single, pop, single population. Um, I can recall, you know, a lot of, um, what I remember was, you know, working with, working in private practice and, and providing clinical services in private practice. And the context was more so, you know, people with insurance and they're coming and they're receiving mental health services. It was a very different experience for me when I had a field placement and I was in Richmond City Department of Social Services in the Child Protective Services Unit, because there was a bit of a disconnect between what I was learning about the social work client in my coursework, but what I was experiencing in my field placement when I'm in the middle of one of the public housing complexes dealing with families whose situations look very differently from the case studies that I was you know, examining throughout my coursework. So I think it's really being mindful that you know, we are looking at and addressing all types of situations that we um, that the material is culturally competent, that we are looking at various races, that we're looking at various socioeconomic statuses. Um, because again, if you don't know, you may not realize that you are perpetuating some of these racist acts or beliefs. Um, and if you don't understand where some of the policies come from, then again, you just assume that's just the way that it is and you don't challenge it. Um, so Daryl mentioned earlier, you know, thinking critically about these things, really learning more about the historical context and sometimes that might not happen in the coursework. So it's then up to us as individuals to take it upon ourselves to try to become knowledgeable and learn about those things. And I think that's the, the big thing here. School can give us a good foundation, but it's only gonna take us so far. And then we are then going to have to make those steps to become informed. And just because I read something one time doesn't mean that that's gonna be the end all and be all because things change, things evolve. So it's constantly staying 
abreast of, you know, the social climate. That's just what we're used to experiencing, but those populations that we might not have as much familiarity with, because that too has an impact on our values and our beliefs and how we practice. Yeah, I, I agree with both Alice and Danica. I think um, I would say it, it, it's, it's what, what is taught and how it's taught, right? Um, I believe, no, I'm gonna tell you, our educational system teaches us that the person at the front of the class, right? This is sort of the how it's taught. The person at the front of the class holds and has all the information. And the people who are in the class, they're just empty vessels and the person at the front of the class knows everything and then they're gonna pour it into the people that's in the class. I don't believe that to be true. I believe that students don't just come as blank slates. I believe that students come with some level of understanding and some knowledge. Um, so that's sort of the how it's taught kind of thing. I think um, if we're teaching people to memorize or just to spit back out information without actually processing it and you know um, critically thinking about things, that's a problem. So um, I think what we, what we teach and how we teach is very important. Um, like just piggybacking off of what Vinny was talking about, we have to teach students. So I think social work training is important. Understanding the, the biopsycho, the biopsycho social spiritual perspective is important to our training. So that's not what I'm talking about. That's, that is social work practice. That gives us the framework for how we're gonna go out and work with individuals, families, groups, communities, and organizations, right? But also, again, how it's taught is important, right? Because the outcome should be that we're teaching you how to think critically, how to problem solve like a social worker. How do we see a problem and address the problem? Those things are important, but also the what you teach. So for me, when I got into grad school, right? And this is sad, right? So my mentor encouraged me to go back to grad school. You know what she told me? She said, Daryl, you're going to have to do double the work, right? Daryl, you need to learn. Do you know who W.E.B. Du Bois is? No. Do you know who such and such and such is? No, right? So she told me I needed to go study that. Those were, those were books and things that were not given to me in any of my other education, which actually, I think, supplemented and helped me to understand the social work education that I was getting. You know, Carter G. Woodson, right? The Miseducation of the Negro. If you haven't read it, you need to go read it now because what he wrote back then is still relevant today, right? But again, I think part of the problem is, is what we're taught. And oftentimes we're never taught about um, different scholars and theorists from, um, that are not white. We're not taught about theories that were um, uh, uh, designed for other people. Most theories that we are, 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 are learning about, right? Um, were designed for middle-class white men. We hear that and we know that, but we still teach it, right? Um, I'm gonna give you another good example of uh, Freud, right? We know a lot of his stuff was based on the, 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 the case study method. But guess what you're gonna learn? Freud and psychodynamic theory. And guess where that's gonna be? On the licensing exam, right? So we teach people things because that's the standard, but we never go back and say, well, you know, is this truly effective? And then when we talk about evidence-based practices, you know, evidence, as Danica says, can change with time, right? So again, I think it's about not just, you know, what you learn, but also how it's taught to you. And if I can add one thing, I think it's important to, to share, especially to give credit to the students who I have had. I know uh, even as an adjunct, um, number one, there's a true lack of, of professors of color in all schools of social work, not just VCU. Um, but when you are a professor of color, and I think this is true whether you're tenure, you're pre-tenure, or you're an adjunct, students of color latch on to you because they see you as a mentor in the field. And often I can give them information and insight into the way I see the world, the way I see social work. The, uh, like you just said, Dara, where your mentor was giving you these books, I'm giving my students all sorts of references that change the way I view the way I do my work. 
And so there is an additional burden that um, professionals of color bear in order to help change these systems. Um, and sometimes that's not recognized. Sometimes we have to fight within our own systems to, to highlight these things. And we have to yell and scream that our students are begging us for more. They're like, what other classes do you teach? Well, I'll take every class. I just want a professor of color for this is the first, or sometimes I hear this is the first time I've had a teacher of color in my entire educational lifetime and the difference that that makes. There's a lot of data um, on, on that issue specifically, but I think it also impacts you know, social work. And I'm more willing to pull out the miseducation of the Negro because I know how important it is for social workers to read that where it may not be to everyone else. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I'm, I'm glad we didn't leave that out there because again, that goes into social work education, right? Um, the lack of representation from black faculty, right? So I would even say when you consider VCU, for example, right? Um, we, our school is located in a majority black city. And, you know, the majority of the students are, you know, white, white, white women, men, um, and non-binary folks, right? So, um, but, but the thing about it, I think we need to be able to teach our students how to go out and serve the community, right? And if we're not, we're sending them out unprepared. Um, there's been times, so, so the, the example that you talked about not having rep representation in terms of black faculty, right? Um, for, for black students, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a welcome um, site in the classroom. And I would say, um, that impacts white students as well, is that if for the first time that you encounter um, a black person in authority, and we're not just talking about, you know, college, because you got your four years of college, you're talking about school social work, which is another couple years, um, on top of, you know, K through 12 education, may not have a, a black male or female teacher or non-binary um, black person or other person of color. The first time that you go out, um, and, and engage with um, a, a person in authority it might be your field instructor or your supervisor. That messes with students. So that impacts white students and it impacts black students, right? Um, the, the, the lack of representation. So it's important, right, to have um, representation at the school in terms of the professors, because you will get a diversity of thought, right? You also get a diversity of styles. Um, you also get, um, but 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 even in that, I think, you know, being a professor at a at a predominantly white institution, right, also comes with some issues, right. Um, so yeah, we have to make schools of social work. Schools of social work need to be need to need to actually represent and look like. Um, the population that's going to be served, um, social service organizations should like the population that's going to be served, right? And the organizations should be constructed in a way that it doesn't make it a hostile environment for uh, professors and, and, as well as well. Yes, and I would like to echo some of the comments I see from students talking about the social justice course being only a one semester class. And outside of that, um, many of the other courses may not focus on this topic and the importance, as Danica mentioned earlier, of having a racial equity lens in all of our courses, not just one semester and we may focus on something entirely different. So we've talked a lot about how um, racist ideologies perpetuate inequalities. And I would like us to discuss how can social work education better prepare students and the workforce to challenge inequalities in practice in child serving settings? And what changes would you like to see in the social work education? I'd love to start answering this one because there is a conversation in Virginia right now about changing the way we prepare child welfare workers to go out into the field. Um, and some of it would be, it, it might look like creating an actual certificate that goes along with your MSW specifically focused on child welfare education. And I think there's an opportunity there to shape 
so much of this into a certification program because what we don't want is for you to spend four years in undergrad, two years in grad school, and then go and become a, a social worker in a local department or even in a private agency. And you had no idea of the client population that you were going to be working with. You had no idea of what really working with families was going to look like. And also the opportunity for some um, social workers to do what I do, which is do policy advocacy and do systemic changes. and um, Looking back, that would have just been so valuable for myself uh, if I had the opportunity to really laser focus on a couple of courses that were so hyper specific to the job to really prepare the workforce and to combine it with the opportunity um, for some scholarships. There's definitely the child welfare stipend program. It is a bit limiting though for what it will pay for when you um, complete the program and what kind of job you have to take. But I think there's opportunity to for the university to step up as a leader and say, we want to be a part of how we change the, the profession of who is becoming social workers, of, of how they are going out into the field. And I think that might look like um, focusing more on a, a true certification program for graduates. And you know, as we've talked about, just infusing social justice isn't just a one one course, one semester, you know, type of a situation. It has to be infused throughout the coursework. A race equity lens has to be infused throughout all courses that are taught. I think another critical area is in terms of field placements. Um, having field placements that um, are in communities of color um, and working with marginalized populations. You know, I, I could recall, you know, where there were certain field placements that people really wanted to get into and they were the, the, the highly clinical settings. Um, but if, if that's what you had in your coursework, if that's what your field placement experience was, then if you're in a setting other than that as your first job, you will be ill-equipped to really be able to understand and to um, really effectively treat that population. Um, our field instructors play a huge role, you know, in this process and in, trying to supplement what may not come across through the coursework. So, you know, as you're dealing with situations, let's look at it through a race lens. So, um, you know, for example, I've been working on something with one of my interns where we were looking at social capital. Well, social capital doesn't look the same way across all populations. So we wanted to focus specifically on what does that look like in low income communities? What does that look like with immigrant populations? You know, because you don't have the same access to resources that you might see, you know, if I was white and living in a community, it will look very differently, you know, in one part of the county versus another part of the county, who I have access to, what resources I have, how I can access those resources. So it's really important to give students that exposure, but to also discuss the different systemic factors that impact the clients that we're working with. Um, something else that's really important is, really helping people to understand who are, what are the demographics of the, the populations that we're working with in our agency. So if, if I come in and I'm just working and I just come in and I treat everybody the same way, but I never take the time to stop and look at, okay, what does this look like from a race standpoint? You know, what majority of folks, you know, are of this race or that race? What does it look like from a gender standpoint? What does it look like from you know, a standpoint of people with disabilities or people who identify as LGBTQ plus? If we don't break it down that way, then we come with this one size fits all approach and we completely overlook that that, that doesn't meet the needs of our community. So I think it's important for, for people, whether you're a student and you're doing an internship or you're an employee in an agency that you really understand your population. Then you look at your staffing, you, know, you look at your boards do, does, do my staff and do my boards, do they represent the populations that I serve? You know, are we in a situation where, you know, I'm an organization that serves a primarily low income community, but all of my board members are white. So we're making decisions through our lens of what will work best in terms of programming and policies and procedures for this population, but yet, we're not talking to the population. We, we, we don't know what their needs are. That's where inclusion comes into play. That's where diversity comes into play, where we don't just want, you know, we want diversity in thought, you know, as Daryl was mentioning, we want diversity in experiences. We want diversity in terms of race, gender, all of those facets. 
So I think really just going in and, and asking those questions and just being aware that they're questions that you should be asking. I love it. Um, I agree. I think um, what I think social work education can do is um, we need to give students the freedom and opportunity to practice, right? Um, ways that they can challenge inequities, right? So we have to give them, I, 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 my, my primary area of teaching has been in field education, right? And, I, and, 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 and field education is a signature pedagogy of social work, meaning that we, that is a part of how people get their BSW and their master's degree. And, and why I think that's important because you learn by doing. I can tell you all day in the classroom, you know, this is what an assessment looks like, but it's different when you, when you can see, touch, smell, and feel it, right? So I think we need to encourage our students in, in a couple ways, right? We, gotta, we have to create those opportunities for them to be able to, um, to, 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 to do that. Um, and it, it may not happen in your field placement, but I think I, I do believe in other um, experiential learning opportunities. Um, you know, I do believe in um, being a member of social work organizations is important. Um, I do believe in service learning. Um, for example, um, I've taught the study abroad to the Dominican Republic. Um, and um, I think students learn a lot about themselves by going abroad. You learn a lot about culture. Um, you start to question things. Um, again, because you learn by doing. So I think um, as much as we can give students opportunities to, to kind of um, to challenge that, to, to learn how to challenge inequities, first I'd be able to identify them and then develop strategies for that is gonna be important. And I think the other thing this kind of ties into the previous question is that we have to abandon this idea of perfectionism, right? We teach our students that, you know, gotta have an A, you gotta have an A, you gotta have an A, right? But if your A is not based on anything but wrote a paper really well, clients do not ask me. In, in my experience, I've never had a client ask me what my GPA was, right? What they wanna know is, can you help me? That's what they wanna know. Um, also like, you know, sort of like these ideologies, right? So this hierarchy, this false hierarchy of if I challenge my supervisor, right? Or I have to do everything my supervisor says, because if I don't, and this goes back to how you teach people in class. If, if I can't ask my, if I can't challenge my supervisor, or if I can't challenge my professor, and I'm just gonna go along to get along just to get that A, then again, this is another way we reinforce inequities, right? So again, I think that's that's part of the what I was talking about earlier, about the what you teach and how you teach it. We have to teach people to not be afraid of conflict, right? Or that conflict is not a that conflict is not a bad thing. You know, that just means we have two different ideologies or two different opinions of how we can come to a solution. So we got to be able to invite that. And I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, we're, we're, we're teaching people to go out and just maintain the status quo. Well, can I add and, one thing there? Sure. I think one of the things I see in the School of Social Work um, that it can be so damaging to how we change the inequities in child welfare is we put so much prioritization on clinical social work. We certainly need clinical social workers, but it's all, I, I usually have field students who are in the macro program and they have had to convince themselves a hundred times over that it is gonna be okay for them to practice macro social work because they have heard anecdotally by, by way of professors, by way of people in the field that they're not gonna have a job. Um, it's not, you know, the, the, the jobs don't, I mean, just so many reasons that they are fearful of doing the macro social work program. The thing is that when they graduate, they email me, Allison, how can I get a job doing what you do? And I will say, you need, you should have had the, um, <laughs> the field experience when you were in the social work program in a policy arena, if you want it, if that's what you want it to do. You, yes, you can, um, make your way into macro social work but i tell them i'm like you're gonna start where i started 
when I first graduated, you're not going to go from clinical social work and then jump over to being a policy director. It typically doesn't work like that. There are different skill sets. There are different ways of thinking. There's, it's, we think about systems and how we change systems. We're not doing um, necessarily clinical social work, although I, I appreciated my first year classes and have that understanding of theories and knowledge. And, but um, that is one way we reinforce racism within our child welfare sector, sector is because we don't create leaders um, who are willing to be uh, system changers, not just individual one-on-one -on -one clients. And I, I tried to tell students there's nothing to fear. There are so many macro social work jobs. I haven't had a student who graduated and a year later are telling me they can't find anything. In fact, it's usually the quite, a, quite the opposite where there's many opportunities and they sometimes have to choose. But if we continue, and there are professors in the School of Social Work who continue to perpetuate that stereotype that get your LCSW or you won't be employable, that is just not, <laughs> it's not true, not the case. If you want to change, if you want to practice policy advocacy, and we desperately need social workers at the General Assembly with me, when I'm walking through the doors of the General Assembly building, which we'll do again one day when this pandemic has calmed down, I'm usually looking around and there's not very many brown people who are there to um, advocate for other black and brown people. It just, it's not a, it's not something that I go in there and I say, look at all of us, look at all of these social workers. What I'm usually thinking is how can we get more people in this building? How can we get more people to understand that social workers desperately need to be here? They need this um, education and this knowledge and we need them to know that macro social work is a pathway to break down these systems of oppression. And you know, you all are making some really good points, you know, especially as it relates to, to macro and micro. But one of the other things, I know we're talking, you know, about current students in the program, but one of the things that I'm really passionate about is drawing more um, students of color to social work in general. Um, when we look at social work as, as an organization, even on a national level, you know, about 60% of social workers, you know, in the United States are white. You know, we've talked earlier from a historical context within the black community, social work is something that we just naturally do. It happens every day. It happens in churches. It happens in houses. It happens with civic organizations. You know, these are things that are very natural to us, yet we don't have um, black students enrolling at the same rate in social work programs. And why is that? Part of that could be because of how social work is, um, how it's portrayed, you know, in the media. Um, part of it could be with the experiences that, you know, some students of color have had with social workers that make them not want to um, become a part of that profession. So what can we do to help change that narrative? I think, you know, we each have a responsibility to help to change that narrative, to share a different story. Um, you know, growing up, I, 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 was in a, I grew up in a very rural community. Um, and so, you know, going into a helping profession when both of my parents were educators, that was something that came really naturally, you know, to me. Um, but if that's not been your experience, then, you know, are you going to be drawn to this profession? The other thing is we have several, you know, HBCUs here in this area. We have Virginia Union right here. We have Virginia State right here, both that have, you know, social work programs on a bachelor's level. How do we partner with them to increase um, the number of students, you know, that they have that are graduating with BSWs and have them in our graduate programs, you know, at VCU. Um, because it's not just a matter of, yes, we need to educate ourselves, those of us who are in the program and who are graduates, but we should also be concerned about educating and having more of us um, who can be these change makers and help make a difference. Thank you so much. Uh, we know many of our attendees today are already working in child service settings. How can current social workers not perpetuate, but rather address racism in practice? Have the conversation. These are tough conversations, but be willing to have the conversation, be willing to, to call it as you see it. If you see something, say something. Um, challenge the status quo. Um, 
<laughs> there was a someone recently attended a training. A lot of conferences are now doing training sessions on you know diversity, equity, and, and inclusion efforts. And so someone um, recently attended a training and heard of a good resource and came back and shared it um, with with other staff. And they're now doing a book study, um, you know, on on that particular book that she learned. I mean, that's what it takes. It takes someone taking an interest, being willing, being courageous, and having those conversations. And I would want to challenge the students that it's, don't think just because you're a student or you may not have the experience that your voice will not be heard or your voice isn't valued. You all have lived through a very different experience over the last couple of years and you bring a perspective that may not be evident in the workplace. So please do not silence your voice just because you feel like you know, you're too young or people won't value or respect you raise your voices, please speak out, challenge the status quo. That is what will be needed to help us move forward. The only thing I would add to that, Danica, because I want to make sure our uh, folks who are listening have an opportunity to ask questions. When you're in the program, or maybe that first year out of the program, what is your fear? What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid of speaking? For me, I needed financial security and that was the truth and the, the truth of it when I really sat down with myself and had all sense of self-awareness. Why did I feel like I couldn't just say, I, I don't think that's a good policy or I think that might that might have unintended consequences. I needed my I need to be able to pay my bills like a lot of people do. Um, whether, and this is probably regardless of um, race, it might be felt more in Black communities or Black folks who are working in social work, but it took me to get to myself to a personal place of financial security. And this is something that I share with my students one-on-one. -on -one. They're like, Ms. Gilbreth, why, can't, why do you feel like you can just, you know, say what you're thinking and, and not be afraid of it? And I say, because I'm not afraid to be fired anymore. There's freedom from that. And, and, and I think most of my colleagues are watching right now that that's like not an issue at all, <laughs> but it does take away the fear factor of why someone may or may not speak up in an organization. Um, and I, so I had to take some steps for myself personally to get to a place where I wasn't going to let that fear stop me from doing what's right to improve our systems. And I'm not afraid of, um, some of it was financial. And then my other fear factor for me was the General Assembly is so very white. And I had a lot of discomfort uh, with rocking the boat sometimes with legislators who have so much power and I felt like I had none. And I had to start convincing myself that I do have power uh, and my voice is important and working through those fears. Thank you. And for the interest of time, we're going to move on to the Q&A session. Um, first, I just want to thank you all so much for engaging in this important conversation. We have touched on many topics. Um, and now if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A feature. Um, and I would ask them to the panelists. So the first question we have is, um, we talked a little bit about kinship care, but um, this person would, you, would like you to speak about systemic racism and child welfare as it pertains to kinship care. While kinship care is now being recognized as essential in keeping children with families, I have recognized some hesitancy regarding kinship placements. Can I, can I, can I, I can start? Oh, go ahead, Daryl. Well, I'm not, I'm gonna I'm be honest with you. I'm, I'm not currently working in a child welfare setting, but I, I can say to this is that um, we could talk about Virginia, for example. Several years ago, I remember um, there was a conversation, well, actually the black social workers were one of the first um, organization pushing kinship care, right? And this is, we're talking about late 60s, 70s, right? Um, and and it, there's evidence that shows that that is um, a, a more effective practice at, um, you know, uh, for, 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 for um, you know, as opposed to removing children from um, family um, and, and their community and culture. However, um, several years ago, I remember they were saying Virginia was like 40 something in the, in the country in terms of um, uh, implementing kinship care. This is kind of what I'm saying about a lot of times 
you know, we know what the best practices are. This was several years ago, right? So um, Danica can probably speak better to this now. I'm wondering where we fare in terms of that now. It's oftentimes we know there's a better policy out there, but we're not acting on it for, for whatever reason, whatever the policy is, whatever the practice is at the time. So um, that's what I would say is in terms of um, we know what the evidence says and then when we go against what the evidence says. Yes, and, and Daryl, and, and this is right up Allison's path as well. Um, but when we look at our, our kinship policies, I mean, one of the things that we cannot ignore is Virginia has one of the most restrictive barrier crimes lists in the nation. That's one of the primary reasons that um, we can't get a lot of our kin approved um, to become foster and adoptive parents. I mean, there may be things that they may have done you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago when they were younger, but those, those things are still coming to haunt them when they then want to be a caretaker for a grandchild or another relative. Um, that's something that I know a lot of advocacy has occurred in terms of trying to deal with the barrier crimes, um, which is something that our General Assembly would have to be, would, would have to be willing to address and, and to change that. And in doing so, you know, that would help to reduce some of those barriers. That's just another example of a policy that is in place that further perpetuates systemic racism. And so we have to look at it from that lens. Also, there's this belief sometimes that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. So, you know, we believe that, you know, if the parents are a certain way, then the, the relatives are the same way. Again, it goes back to challenging those biases that we hold, um, that we have to be aware of. This is where supervision comes into play, where as supervisors, um, it's asking those questions. So if you hear, well, this person isn't an acceptable, you know, relative, relative caretaker, asking that social worker, well, what are, what are the reasons behind that? You know, and then looking at, again, how can we reduce some of those barriers versus using those barriers as a reason to not move forward with a potential placement? The only thing I will add to that is the financial um, uh, hoops that families have had to go through as kinship caregivers. It was not until the General Assembly session um, that, that we just previewed, basically the newest budget that has been signed into law that kinship caregivers were going to be financially recognized in not even the same way, but in some way at all. So we finally have some financial uh, ability for kinship caregivers to receive financial assistance. This is not known all over the state yet. This is part of sometimes the problem is we pass a law or we get something included in a budget and it can take years before we see that impact in our state. And I think that's one of the things that's going to happen around this area of kinship care is it's going to take a while for us to say, oh, wait, now there is financial assistance. What is our excuse now? Besides, you know, we know about barrier crimes, but um, that has been a substantial barrier where you we're asking families sometimes to take two or three kin into their home and we're saying good luck. <laughs> we would not, we would never say that to a foster family. We would be giving them a foster care maintenance payment, child care subsidy, child car seats, everything else. So I'm going to stop there so we can answer some more questions. Yes, the next question states, I'm a freshman at VCU earning my BS degree. I was wondering what are some things you wish you knew when you were in my position and what are things to look out for as far as opportunity? I, I wish that I had done, um, as we we're talking about today and what Daryl has stated so much, was just to critically challenge what, what I was learning and not to just accept everything as this is the gospel. Um, you know, that's something that's come with greater years of experience um, and really doing more work to learn more and educate myself, you're probably saying, well, you're, you're a black woman, you know, these are things that you should know. Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I still, as, as a black woman, have to educate myself about these things because my experiences are not the experiences of all black people, you know? And so, you know, I think that's the key piece is just continue to critically analyze, to learn, learn from multiple perspectives 
Um, you know, don't just get so locked in when I'm reading and following one particular researcher that, you know, you completely lose the diversity of thought that may exist with others who are out there that are researching. Also look at, you know, what populations, if, if we're talking about evidence-based practices, for example, you know, what population did they use these practices with? You know, are they using them with the populations that you're really serving? So it really just goes back, just critically analyzing, digging a little bit deeper, um, because that, that education is really key. I simply would say, um, take responsibility for your education, right? So um, don't just sit in the class and expect people to give you information, education. So there's a quote that says, uh, a person receives two educations, one that's given to them and one that they give themselves. So you need to determine what are the things that I want to know? What kind of social worker do I want to be, right? Get you a mentor, right? Do all of those things. Um, don't just try to skate by and get, if you're just there to get a degree, then you know, you're just there to get a degree. But take responsibility for your education, taking responsibility for what you know, what you don't know, what you need to know is going to be important, not for your own individual self, but for the clients that you're going to serve. And Abigail, I would love if you read that anonymous attendee question, because I'd love to answer that one. Yes. Um, it states, this is also a reminder that Black social workers can be impacted by the same system that can be harmful to our clients. How do you guys balance or manage harmful interactions that you encounter in your careers? It seems so exhausting. This is such a good question because this reality is so very true. I want to start with, um, it took me a while to understand that I was raised by a generation of that could be categorized as baby boomers and they had a way that they worked. They kept their head down, they did their jobs, they stayed in their jobs no matter what kind of um, racial abuse that they received because that's how that that's what they were told to do that's how they were raised um, and their number one goal was to provide for their children to have, make their children be I'm a first generation college student so I didn't have the understanding when I went into the workforce that um, how to address these challenges because I couldn't call my mom and dad they would say you need to just deal with it and get that paycheck but I, I, I couldn't reconcile that um, with myself as a social worker. I just, I, I knew I couldn't do it. And that was part of the um, reason why I had to get myself into a different financial situation where I didn't have to just put up with anything. But there is a certainly um, a certain amount of burden that sometimes uh, Black social workers can have in addition to our job responsibilities because we're also ingrained in the community for the most part. You know, we're, we are seeing what is happening in our communities and it is us. I always tell people when I'm in a child welfare meeting, sometimes you're just seeing data on a, on a spreadsheet. I'm seeing my family. Uh, and, and it means, and it hits different. <laughs> um, as many of us have to do things to take care of ourselves mentally so that we can continue to do the job. Um, for me, I have a very low tolerance for any kind of, um, anyone that I work with on a, on a regular basis to have any kind of systemic biases or anything like that. I can't do it. <laughs> I just can't, I can't do my job and I'm more vocal about it because I, I understand the, um, the impact that it has on me personally as a person. Um, and I, I do, I, one of the, I have, there's plenty of different strategies you can put in place to help yourself. For me, I read my news. I don't watch it because it has a different trauma response for me. I can read um, articles. I, I tell people I probably read 10 to 20 articles a day because I want to keep abreast of what's happening in the world, but I don't watch a lot of television where I can visually see it. It's just a different way my brain works. Um, and I think finding what are your triggers, what, how, um, and how it can help you navigate your world as a social worker, and what makes you feel um, <clears throat> best about yourself, especially as a Black social worker. For me, when people ask, why did you want to be an adjunct professor? My number one answer is because I wanted to see myself when I was in the program. I wanted to see a professor who looked like me, and I could complain about it, or I could call VCU and say, what can I do to help change this? And they were like, do you want to <laughs> teach a class? Absolutely. And that um, helps me through some of the, the 
challenges that we see in the community knowing that I have a way to, to make a difference. I would also, you know, add to that, that it really is important to have others in the profession um, who, you know, sort of understand. I've definitely been blessed to have other colleagues, other, you know, men and women of color, um, as, as well as, you know, colleagues who are not, who have been extremely supportive that we can have these open, honest conversations with. Um, that I can share these experiences and have somebody else say, you know, like, no, you know, that that isn't right. Or, you know, this does appear that we are being judged differently or held to a different standard um, because of the color of our skins. And I think it's just important to be able to articulate that um, and have a safe space because you're right, it is it is definitely exhausting. And I'll, I'll try to wrap mine up real quick. I'll just say that it, it's evolved for me as I've grown as a professional. Um, there was in times when I just didn't feel empowered to speak. Um, I was too nervous. I was in fear of losing my job because I was in survival mode. But part of my survival mode now is speaking up, even if my voice quivers, to quote Mitt Joyner, um, who's the president of the NESW. Um, so, um, I do exactly what Danica says. So me being a member of the Black Social Workers, that is a healing space for me. When we have meetings, we're in, we're in community with, with one another, that, that's where I draw my energy from. And also, I try to remember why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because a lot of times, it's not just about me. It's not about me and the client that I'm working with. Sometimes me addressing a colleague or a coworker is a form of advocacy for other people that may come behind me as a social worker in this position or um, is gonna be working with the people that I'm gonna be working with. So I always try to leave a place that I'm working at better than I left it. And thank you all for your questions. Um, we do recognize that this is an ongoing conversation, but for the interest of time, these are all the questions we can answer today. And as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and a link will be emailed to you. We also include the resources discussed by the panelists um, and some that might be helpful to the conversation. If you have any additional resources to share or ideas for future webinars, um, please fill out the feedback form that Naomi put the link to in the chat. And also if you have any resources that might be helpful in digging deeper into this conversation, please put it in the chat as well. Um, I wanna take this time to thank our incredible panelists, Allison, Daryl, and Danica for taking the time out of their busy schedule and being with us today and having this necessary and important conversation. Um, we also like to thank the School of Social Work Leadership and Community, in particular, Jamie Cage, who is an assistant professor, Jeff LoCicero, the director of communication for this wonderful work they did behind the scenes and in collaborating together. And lastly, we'd like to thank the leadership of the Child Welfare Stipend Program, Dr. Rebecca Gomez and Naomi Reddish. Thank you so much, Naomi, for bringing us together and for providing an opportunity for us to have this conversation today. Abigail, thank you. Thank you so much um, for being my collaborator and moderator today. Um, we are so grateful. Um, I am so grateful to know and work with you, Abigail. Um, thank you all again to the panelists for your commitment to this work. Uh, thank you to all the participants for joining us today. Uh, you are such an important part of the VCU School of Social Work community. Um, together, we will grow and become uh, agents of change. Uh, so we hope to continue this work uh, internally in conversation with social workers and as we advocate for racial equity in our child serving systems and social work community. So thank you all for being here.